As you do, if you'd like to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 32, Psalm 32. And before we read from God's Word, I'd like to um, express just a pastoral thankfulness. Um, last week we studied at Paul's exhortation to the church in Ephesus about gathering together the priority of church fellowship, church mutual care, and um, I, I know personally I had a delightful experience in my community, this group this week, just listening to people share how they were being impacted uh, by God's word, by that passage, and how God was meeting them in various ways, and I heard from others uh, a similar report of how God met them this week in their community groups. I, I just want to thank you uh, for your responsiveness to God's word. Uh, last week, I, I certainly uh, we are grateful for that in an ongoing way in this church, but I just wanted to seize the moment and say uh, thank you for being a church that responds to God's word, that doesn't just listen and, and walk away unchanged, that looks to apply it uh, even immediately in that very week. So, so thank you for being responsive. That is honoring to God. And I trust joyful ultimately to us um, because our joy ultimately is found as we entrust ourselves to the Lord. And that is true again this morning. Uh, we have a, a delightful section of God's Word before us. Uh, it's one that I, I, I imagine many of you have read before, and I am praying that God will bring fresh delight as we study it this morning. Uh, so let's open our hearts and our minds, and let's read God's Word. Psalm 32, verse 1. A maskil of David... Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You are preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. My wife recently uh, informed me in a caring, gracious, loving sort of way that she suspected I wasn't drinking enough water and as I began to self-assess my water intake and look up how much water a grown person is supposed to be drinking, I found that she was quite right. There was a woeful lack of water intake. And as I was evaluating this and thinking about how much more water I should be drinking, uh, something came to mind from when I was a kid. And I, I know you have these kind of thoughts too, these kind of crystal clear memories where a lot of the things you don't remember at all. But this, this came to mind. I remember having a moment. I was standing at my, my kitchen sink. I was getting a very small glass of water. I'm probably outside playing or, or something. And I remember having this thought that seemed very reasonable at the time come to mind. And it, it went something like this. I don't really need a lot of water. I can, I can actually make it 
with very minimal amount of water. And the, the atmosphere of my thought was, was basically very self-impressed. Uh, it had this, I, I can remember even the attitude that I, I had this thought with. It's like, it, it's impressive how little water I need. I'm not like these wimpy guys that need to be constantly slavering water all over themselves because they can't make it very far. I can make it with very little. That's pretty impressive. I'm tough. Something along those lines. You know, 10 or 11 years old. And I, I, I brought that to mind. I think it, it came to mind because I thought, I wonder if that same arrogant perspective has lingered into adulthood. Some thought like it's impressive if I don't drink as much water. Like that's maybe an impressive trait of toughness or something. I thought maybe, maybe it has. Maybe it's lingered. Maybe the idea that just getting by with just barely enough has lingered and affects me even to this day. What's more concerning to me is that I think sometimes I think the same way about grace. I think sometimes I get by with just enough personal experience of seeking the grace of God. I think sometimes I have certainly nothing against grace, it's not like I would stand at a street corner and denounce water either. But, but, but in, in terms of an ongoing daily sense of my need for it and a, a sort of a personal interaction with it, a, a functional dependence on grace, I, I sometimes wonder if I treat it the way I treat water. Well, it's good. I mean, I need it. I wouldn't declare I'm like the one waterless person in the world. No, but, but, but I'm not sure it's this ongoing, aggressive, delightful pursuit. And maybe sometimes still in my heart, there's this subtle idea that I can get by without it. What David is exhorting us to do, first through his personal testimony and then through a broader exhortation in this passage, is to say, seek the grace of God and the God of grace. Seek the grace of God and the God of grace. Seek him, seek his grace, and allow the fact that he is gracious to draw you near to him in a profound, ongoing dependence, especially given your knowledge that you and I and David continue to sin. Seek the grace of God and the God of grace, especially given our knowledge that we continue to sin. Be aware of a tendency in the Christian heart, in my heart, and in your heart, to see how little you can get away with. Not against it, but you think of it perhaps as a past thing, and you see, how far can I go without needing a fresh experience of seeking and being assured of the grace of God. David breaks down this exhortation example to us. Basically, in the, the first part is this personal testimony. He celebrates the grace of God, and he talks about an experience he had when he was tugging away from God and what it was like when he finally acknowledged his sin to God, what he encountered. There's a, a testimony. You notice that's verses 1 through 5. Then in the remainder of the chapter, he turns that testimony into a broader exhortation. So you notice there in verse 6, Six, the word therefore. He's basically saying, in light of my experience of grace and God's grace, here's how you should relate to God. Let me encourage the rest of you to take advantage of my example. So we'll break it down that way as well. The testimony and the exhortation. Those are the two points, okay? First of all, the testimony. Let's dive in. David begins writing with this explosion of praise, and these words should be precious to us. The, the, the opening two verses of Psalm 32 are well worth memorizing and meditating upon. They are, they are well worth remembering when you wake up in the morning. The, the, this is one of those verses that it would be good to start the day with. Verses like this remind us of our identity in Christ, that we are a people wholly and completely and permanently dependent on grace. There is our identity, in a sense, wrapped up in these two verses. So he explodes in praise and declares in advance what his experience has been. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. 
Blessed is the one. That transgression that was outside the law of God, that did not follow God, he said there is great blessing for that one who will not be punished for his sin. That is in one sense what what forgiveness is. It's the reality that the sin that should be punished is not punished. Actually, when my kids are little, that's one of the, the little mantras that I teach them. What is grace? And they'll answer, grace is God's goodness to people who should be punished. That's what verse 1 says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. And then he compiles a parallel theme, whose sin is covered. This is another image, this idea that that we have this sin that is exposed before God's all-seeing eye, and yet God, in his mercy, has covered over that sin so that he does not see it against us. And no wonder that's good news, because for a holy God to see sin necessitates judgment. God never saw a sin that he won't eventually punish. Do you know that? I was reading a wonderful book this week. If you've never read uh, the book Holiness by J.C. Ryle, I would highly recommend it to you. And one of the things he was talking about in that book is how it's so possible, and he was talking about a culture uh, many, many um, hundred years ago, and it's even more true today. It's so possible for us to minimize the heavenly perspective of sin. We're aware of mistakes and, and sins that we can count grievous in some way, but he's saying we, we minimize sin, and the great consequence of that is we don't see a gratefulness for the grace of God welling up in our souls. That, that's the, the effect of seeing the sinfulness of sin, is that we become grateful for the grace of God. That's what David is here. He's grateful that his sin is covered. But, but if sin is something not that severe or dangerous to us, we don't find it delightful that it's covered. I, I've done a very, very few, rightly so, very few housing projects in my life. One of the things that always is remarkable to me is, is how uh, brilliant you know, builders and people that have created the construction industry, they, they are at covering over uh, what is obvious mistakes? It's remarkable the number of tools that are present. I mean, the whole concept of baseboards is to cover over this very unappealing gap between the floor and the drywall. It's brilliant. I didn't, I didn't really, you don't think about this when you're like not handy like I am until you actually have to do it. And you look down and you think, that looks terrible. Why have I never noticed this before? And then you put the baseboard and think, oh, it, it covers it. It's this whole part of building that just covers over what you don't see. We, earlier this week, or last week, there was a, a big hole in, in, in our wall because of a door that had been pushed open too aggressively too many times. And so they have this great stuff called spackling. It's amazing. You just cover over the stuff, and then you can paint over that, and the whole thing is covered. And if you don't stand too close, you can't even see it anymore. It's wonderful stuff. They have caulking. It's great, amazing stuff. You can cover over very unappealing, disgusting holes and cracks and terrible places where things can get in. It's remarkable. It's just an amazing thing. Listen, if we don't think of sin as not just unappealing, but as devastating to our permanent reputation with God, we won't be impressed when it's covered over. You don't cover over something you're mildly amused at. You cover over something that is devastating. Sin is devastating to our reputation before God. The smallest sin, every sin, any amount of a creature defying his creator in word, thought, or deed is devastating to us. And so when David says, blessed is the one whose sin is covered, he's packing into a word the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in the gospel, God covers over our sin. It's the word that we heard this morning, that when that that destroyer came to the people in Egypt to seek out someone to pay for sin, there, there was a covering of blood. There was a sacrifice where their sin on the inside was covered over by the sacrifice. And, and that's the truth of the gospel. When we come to the New Testament, we see that that's ultimately the way God would do it. He would cover over our sin by the penalty paid on Jesus Christ so that we are covered 
covered over. Our devastating sin has been removed from his sight. He makes it explicit in the next verse. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. This, this is a legal idea that in spite of having sin, sin is not counted against us. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more glorious than this, that in spite of the fact that you and I have sins this week that defy God and turn him away from us, God doesn't count those sins against us. It is as if we have this week committed a felony and we go into the court and it cannot be counted against us. All the evidence is there. All of the reasons for us to be guilty and punished and sent away forever are there. But for some reason, it can't be credited to our account. That's what David is saying. Isn't that good news for a felon? Isn't it good news for every felon sitting in this room? And that is every single human. You know, every single human is a felon in the sight of God. And God says, you felons, isn't it a good thing that your felonies are not counted against you? Oh, isn't that a good thing? No wonder David said, blessed blessed. But then he goes into a a testimony where he wasn't enjoying this blessing. It was true for him, but he was resisting it. He wasn't feeling the effects of it. And honestly, I think there are many seasons in the Christian life where verse 3 is the case. Listen to what he says. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, Here's a clue. Your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So David is reviewing a time where, though he knows God, though he is a believer, he has been resisting the convicting voice of God in some pattern or evidence of sin in his life. He's been withholding the acknowledgement of that sin before God. And isn't it somewhat ridiculous that humans can do this? You and I can do this. We're aware of some area of sin, some pattern of internal, external kind of rebellion. We're resisting God, and we feel his hand upon us. Have you ever had that experience? Well, you, I know this to be wrong, and I, I sense some pressure upon me. Have you ever felt that kind of pressure of soul? I, I know that I'm not supposed to be doing this. But you sort of resist that pressure, and it just becomes miserable to you. Now, I think some Christians, and all of us at some level, one temptation is just to learn to live with that sense of pressure towards sin permanently. Have you ever had that experience, maybe in a lengthy season of your life, there's certain areas of sin, and you just get used to the sense that this is wrong, and I'm going to do it anyway. At least I'm not all bad. David is saying for him that that experience was, it was miserable. It was like his bones were being wasted away and crushed. It was like he was dried up out on some some desert plateau under the sun. He's saying, look, my strength was all gone. Why? Because God's hand was on me. And and the more I, I tried to tug away from him, the more miserable I became. I was reading this this week. It reminded me we have this new dog, uh, which many of you know, and, 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 and we're trying to teach the dog to heal, right, to what puppies don't like doing. I mean, because everything else is more exciting than, than I am. So he, he just wants to go smell everything and eat people and do things. And so he's running, running away. And when you have a leash, and every time he goes, the harder he pulls, the harder it tugs back at him. And it's remarkable how foolish dogs can be. I mean, he is tugging his neck off, trying to get somewhere. And I'm thinking, look, if you just back up, we'll get there eventually. Listen, David says that's what it's like for him resisting God. He's like, the harder I I just tried to strain against the Lord, but I could just sense his hand was upon me. Listen, we need to see in verse 3 an evidence of the grace of God. Just like we need to see when we sit under God's word or when we read God's word in the mornings or we talk about it in fellowship group and we feel that that sense of discomfort. I mean, be honest with yourself. You, You feel that sometimes. That sense of, oh, I think that's me. I feel the tug. I feel the hand upon me. You have that experience. There's some area of your life where you, you feel that, the tug. I, I, I am not where I should be right now. 
We need to see that as the grace of God because what God is doing for David is to bring him to a place where he can celebrate verse 1 and 2. Isn't it good that when I acknowledge my sin to God, I experience the blessing and the joy of forgiveness. When I just acknowledge that I am sinful and that I should be surrendered to you, actually what happens is instead of wrath, instead of punishment, instead of sorrow, I experience joy. I experience joy welcome. I experience the the kindness of God towards sinners. As long as I'm tugging away from God and trying to lunge towards that sin, I, I feel his hand upon me, pulling me back, keeping me close, insisting that I not run from him forever. And isn't it kind of God that he doesn't unloose the leash and let us run towards destruction? Listen, conviction is infinitely kinder than wrath. Conviction is, is, is just gentle, kind. The, the pain we experience in conviction, it, it's just like a miniaturized picture of what ultimately awaits a sinner who runs away from God. I, I, I say this to my children sometimes when they have to be disciplined. I say, look, look, oh, what, what daddy is doing, he, he's just giving you a, a very, very small reminder that sin is dangerous. But if you won't respond to to daddy just gently trying to help you see the danger of sin, do you know what's going to happen? Ultimately, daddy won't do any good, and you'll have to face God's judgment. And trust me, what 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 I'm doing to help you see the danger of sin, it's just small. It's just a, a, a very small portion compared to what will take place if you run permanently away from God. And you see that in David's life here. He's saying, oh, my my bones were groaning. My strength was dried up. I was miserable. But you can see the grace of God in that he wants him to experience the joy of forgiveness. So David says, what did he do? In verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And what happened? What happened the moment David acknowledged his sin? Notice in verse 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave it. David's testimony here is designed to hand a gift to every believer. Look, when you feel the tug of God's conviction hand on your life, or maybe even some way in which you sense that because of your sin, there is some divine discipline that is at work, where you sense the sorrow of sin is working its way out in your soul. Listen, what God is doing, he's inviting you to experience the joy of forgiveness. Sin lies to us. Sin says, if you just keep resisting God and keep holding on to this idol and keep ignoring the voice of God, well, this is the path to freedom. And God says, no, if you repent of your sin and acknowledge that this is wrong, immediately God reminds you of his forgiveness available because of Jesus. Listen, most of us, we delay confession of sin far too long. Or, you know what else we do as gospel-centered people? We tend to think of grace as something that we have as a possession that we don't need to rehearse in an ongoing way. Is sin forgiven if we forget about it and forgot to confess it? Well, Well, of course, Jesus pays for all of our sins, past, present, and future. It's not like you will suffer God's judgment because you forgot to confess a certain sin. But there are many sins that we haven't forgotten about that are available to us to confess and that we sense God's conviction on that as long as we are hiding from the confession of that sin, we are not experiencing the joy of God's forgiveness. Listen, we're like a dog on a leash. And even worse, we're like a dog thinking there's something pleasurable over there where the master is actually sitting here with a a bounty in front of us. Stop tugging and come back. Anything you want out there is actually here in greater abundance. Come back. Repent. Stop holding on to your sin. Do what David says. I acknowledge my sin to you. And that's painful because that means we have to admit that we can't continue to seek it out. 
I acknowledged. I acknowledged my sin to you. Look, sometimes we, we think of grace as this, this freedom from ever thinking about sin. No, that is not the case. Grace is not a freedom from ever thinking about sin. The moment you feel conviction, oh, I, I shouldn't feel that way. That's condemnation. No, no, condemnation is experiencing the judgment of God. Conviction is the invitation to experience a fresh reminder of forgiveness. We, we have to distinguish the difference between those two things. David's testimony is designed to motivate Christians to realize God is gracious. When you acknowledge your sin to him, he gives you the blessing of knowing, I don't count it against you. I don't count it against you. So Christian, stop trying to make up for it and feel better through your own works. Stop trying to ignore it and think somehow you're more stubborn than God. Listen, God's grace is more stubborn than your sin. If you're a Christian, you will be miserable as long as you don't acknowledge your sin to God. This is your permanent condition until you acknowledge this is not honoring you. I acknowledge it to be sin. And then you receive the assurance, I have forgiven you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's David's testimony. But like he often does, David turns his testimony into an exhortation. And not just about individual confessions of sin, about a way of life. David is essentially saying, look, in light of how God deals with us in our sin, in our worst part, how then should we relate to him in all of life? In light of the fact that this is who God is, what should be our disposition towards him? So he says, seek the grace of God, and in light of that grace, seek the God of grace. Notice point two, the exhortation. Therefore, David says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Important to understand from a Jewish mindset uh, in this day and age, that the waters were this, this place of, of judgment and chaos and hopelessness. And so to, to face rushing waters was to face ultimate catastrophe. You might think of the flood of Noah's time. There's this sense that this is a catastrophe that only God can rescue you from. And David says, you are a, a hiding place for me. This theme is throughout the Psalms, this idea of refuge. It's one of the primary themes. This idea that there's a place that outside of that place, there is only devastation. But inside, there is safety. Outside, there is danger. Inside, there is life. When I, when I teach my children the story of Noah, often what I'll call the ark is a special place to save him. Because the ark is a picture of the refuge that God is and that he ultimately is in the salvation of Jesus. So what, what is the ark that saved Noah when that great flood came? It was a special place to save him. That's what God is. He's a special place to save you. And so David says, look, while you have time, while he may be found, and I think that's an exhortation to urgency, do not delay drawing near to the God who wants to be your refuge. Listen, if you're, if you're a, a, a Christian, have been for a long period of time, but there is some area of, of sin that you have been holding on to or hiding or is unconfessed, what David is saying is, now bring your prayer of confession now to the Lord. And especially if you read this and you are maybe a, a grown-up church kid or you're here as a guest and, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this is the message of the Bible to you. There is a great God. Sin is offensive to him. It's turning away from him, but he offers himself as a protection from his own judgment. It's like the greatest judge ever. You are guilty, but if you claim my mercy, I will protect you from your rightful punishment. That's what David is saying in verse 6. He's saying, let anyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. And here's the result. You will be a hiding place from the catastrophes that happen towards those who are opposing God. Ultimately, the catastrophe of God's judgment. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Listen, don't you want to be surrounded by a God who is gracious to sinners? 
Don't you want to be surrounded by his steadfast love and his mercy and his goodness? The promises that we have in the New Testament that state that every single thing that happens to us is directed by God's loving kindness towards us, that we can't be separated or taken out of the goodness and love of God, that nothing in heaven or earth, past or present, future, angels, demons, anything can pluck us from the love of God. That's what David is saying here. Look, God in Christ is a refuge for sinners. And because he's gracious, we don't have to be afraid that our sin will eject us from that place of safety. And if you offer prayer to him in your sin, you'll be freshly reminded that God covers over and protects and preserves even sinners who have defied him. Draw near, David is saying. Entrust yourself to the God of grace. There's some disagreement about verses 8 and 9. Is this David quoting what God has said to him? Or is this David, as God's representative, uh, speaking to the people? <laughs> I'm not sure, frankly, if which it is. Is, is this David quoting God, or is this God speaking through David uh, as his representative? In either case, from the perspective of an Israelite, the, the effect is really the same. Because the king was God's representative, for David to say, I will instruct you, draw near to me, was something like saying, draw near to God's anointed one, which is like saying, draw near to God. In any case, for us, I think the application is the same. Verses 8 and 9 reveal the heart of God towards people who are prone to wander. It reveals the heart of God towards Christians who are prone to wander. You know that great hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That's a paraphrase in a hymn form of verses 8 and 9. It's as though God and David are saying, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye on you. Don't be like a horse or a mule. What, what, a, what a graphic image. Look, you all know the ornery, stubborn mule that will not obey and stay near you unless you force him to painfully. Look, look this is the heart of the Lord toward the Christian. He has no desire to forcibly help a Christian see the danger of sin. His heart is that we would willingly draw near to him, that we would willingly repent. And we see this pattern in Scripture where there is unrepentant rebellion, where there is the refusal to listen to God, where there is this hard-heartedness when God's hand of conviction and the unwillingness to experience the joy of, of repentance and then forgiveness. It's like a, a mule who just keep tugging away from God. And he's saying, don't, don't be like that. Be like a, a loving, trusting child that comes and asks and is near. That, that's what we should be like. Seek the God of grace. There's no reason in light of his grace to stray away from him. He says the reasons for this are obvious in verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Those mule-like Christians who are continually turning away from God and thinking that a life of wickedness is more pleasurable should hear this as the ultimate end of those who live in rebellion against God. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but here's the good news. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. We know that wonderful phrase, steadfast love. That's God's covenant love. That's his unchanging mercy. That's his, his love that is new and, and refreshed every day, that never runs out, that is faithful even in the midst of our rebellion, that is patient with our impatience, that is kind with our unkindness, that is gracious with our self-righteousness, that is enduring with our faltering steps. That is the love of God. That that holds fast to us, that's revealed ultimately in Jesus because God has united us to his son such that how we are treated by God is how God views his son. That, that's that steadfast love. That's the love that surrounds the Christian that trusts in the Lord. I've had a thought often in difficult times in, in my life where I was suffering or aware of some sin. I thought, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to heaven. 
And it just relativizes everything else. At the end of the day, because of Jesus Christ, I'm surrounded by the steadfast love of God. Because Jesus received my punishment and I received union with him, I, I'm surrounded. I'm, what, what, a, what a wonderful phrase. I'm, I'm surrounded. I'm encircled by the steadfast love of God. There's no crack of God's wrath or judgment that can seep in because what is around me is God's love. God's steadfast love cannot be flanked. It cannot be penetrated. It cannot be broken down. It is a bastion of absolute security. That's where you stand, Christian, if you have been united to Jesus in faith. The, the wicked who tried to find refuge away from God, there's nothing they can look forward to except for sorrow, false dreams, false hopes, lying idols, and sorrow. But for the Christian who endures temptation and turns again to God in their sin, there is this encircling, powerful, steadfast love so that even the worst moments in life, you can say, I stand in the middle of a, a powerful circle of God's love given to me because he sent his son and united me to his son. No wonder verse 11 concludes this exhortation with David saying to the believer, be glad, believer. Be glad in the Lord. Be glad and rejoice, O righteous. And, and obviously, this is very important for the Psalms. When the Psalms talk about a, a righteous person, they're not, they're not in every sense referring to a perfect person. Obviously, David himself at the beginning of this psalm acknowledges that he's not perfect. He's not saying, be glad, all you people who are perfectly righteous. Righteous here in the Psalms, usually it means someone who is genuinely, if imperfectly, following God, who acknowledges their sins. To be righteous in the Psalms is to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Isn't that freedom? You don't have to be perfectly righteous. You just have to faithfully acknowledge your sin and receive God's grace. Draw near to God and stop resisting him. That's what it means to be righteous in the Psalms. Be righteous be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. What does it mean to be upright? It means to be focused on God and following him, not perfectly, but genuinely. L listen, here's the overall theme of this psalm. The overall theme is because God is gracious to sinners, sinners can seek and trust their lives to him. It's this, this calling, seek the grace of God and seek the God of grace. Let me appeal to you. I'd, I'd like you to do something right now that will be temporarily painful, but will result in joy. I'd like you to pick an area in your life that most feels like what David is describing, that the hand of the Lord is upon you in this, in a convicting kind of way. I, I'd like you to do that right now. I'd like you to pick an area. What's an area in your life? Is it the way you speak? Is it the way you relate to others? Is it what you watch? Is it how you spend? Is it certain idolatry of life that you, you crave certain things and they, they just got a hold on you? Is it maybe just a godlessness of life? Not so much a blatant sin, but just a, a lack of centering your life on God. Maybe you're not the ornery mule. You're, you're just the mule who likes wandering in the pastures far away from its master. Pick an area right now. Pick an area where you could honestly say, yeah, I, I, maybe I don't feel the hand of the Lord, but I, I feel the finger of God pointing out this area. And right now, right now, you can do it right now. That's the wonderful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no payment that you can make for that sin. You, you, you can't pay for lust by not lusting. You know that? You can't pay for self-righteousness by being more humble. You can't pay for materialism by giving more money away. You can't pay for it. It's done. It's on the record. It's on the account sheet. The good news is, 
There is one who received all iniquities counted against him. Even this one that comes to mind. They were counted against him. God counted them on Christ. You have done this, and you have watched, and you have seen, and you have spoken, and you have yelled, and you have demanded, and you have indulged. He counted them against Christ fully and completely on the cross. That's why Christians keep focused on the cross, because every single sin that is not counted against us was counted against him. So I I want you right now, in your mind, it's already taken place in history, but in your mind, I want you to place that sin on Jesus on the cross. Now, God's already done this. This is just for our our soul to appreciate the reality of this, okay? What what we're doing when you place your area of sin, and kind of visually, I think visually, so visually kind of, okay, it's as though that sin was credited to him. It It is written over him. They're hanging on that cross. It is is written on him. What that is doing is is it's acknowledging this is a sin that was so great it required the death of the Son of God to pay for. Look, you, you can't be near to the cross and minimize the severity of your sin. You can't justify it by saying, well, they were angrier than I was. Or, or they're self-righteous, and therefore I have a right to be self-righteous too. Or there are certainly people who are more indulgent than I am. Or I'm not nearly as addicted to some things as other people are. No, when you're standing at the cross of Christ and you say, that, that sin, the reason it's not counted against me is because it was counted against him. So I want you right now to take that sin, whatever it is, and, and I want you to, in your mind, count it as having been counted against Jesus on the cross. And in that moment, declare, this is sin. I acknowledge my sin to you. And then what I want you to do is believe. Because Jesus counted something to you too. He counted the opposite of your sin towards you. So if you're angry, I want you to just visually in your mind, take a moment when Jesus was calm and patient and count that to you. If you're indulgent and lacking self-control, I want you to take a moment where Jesus was obedient even to the point of death and, and count that to you. That's the gospel. Your sin counted against Jesus and and his righteousness counted to you. Him paying for our sins so that David could say, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. He isn't declaring that God has ignored sin. He's declaring in advance that there is a way for sin to be paid for. And it's, it's your sin that he's talking about. What are moments that you've neglected the convicting voice of God? What are moments that you've been more like a mule than an obedient child? What what are those moments? Bring those to the cross of Christ. Count them as having been punished in Christ. And then count his righteousness as having been given to you. So that now you stand as as loved and accepted and welcomed to God as Jesus Christ is. You are able to be as close and and near and tender to God as Christ is because you are in Christ. So when David says, don't don't be like a mule or a horse that has to be bridled and the bit in their mouth to yank them back. No, come because, because the God you're coming to is a God who's paid for your sin and invites us to come freely regardless of what that area was, regardless of its severity or its persistence. You can draw near to God and be here I am again, Lord. And now I want you to receive Verse 11, as a personal command. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. I want you to receive this as a personal command. If you have acknowledged that recent... Now, David's a believer in this passage, I think. This is not the general call for the wicked to repent. This is a call to believer, like many of us. Repent, acknowledge your sin, 
receive the blessing of God's forgiveness, commit to not be like that mule that turns away from God, but like the child that clings to him, commit to be that way, and then here's the command. Here is the command for you. I want you to personalize this. Put your name in front of verse 11. Put your name there. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, O you upright in heart. See, the, the Psalms are, are, are a different kind of poetry. They work with, with balance and parallelism, so we don't always feel this in the same way that we feel our meter in rhyme. But I want you to see how the beginning of this psalm leads to the end of the psalm. Do you see that? The, the beginning is the theological truth. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, and the end is our personal response. Rejoice in the Lord, you upright. Rejoice, you forgiven one. Rejoice, you one who just acknowledged your sin and was reminded that God forgives even the worst and even the longest. I want you to take it as a personal exhortation, as a personal command. I, I want you to, to feel this. I, I, I want you, John and Rob, and, and I want you, Janice, and I, I want you, Mike, I, I want you to feel this. Put your name there. Rejoice because the Lord has forgiven you of those sins you have freely repented of before him. If you have genuinely, you're not holding anything back. I think that's the point about the, the spirit in which there is no deceit. You're not kind of holding something back from God. You're just honestly acknowledging, I am a sinner and I am sinful in this way. And I bring it to you and I declare, I need your forgiveness. And then you receive that forgiveness. And then what should the result be? Rejoice. Rejoice forgiven ones. Rejoice sinner paid for by the blood of Christ. Rejoice one that has been claimed as a child. Rejoice one that has been brought near to the God of grace. Rejoice one who no longer needs to pay for their sin. Rejoice one who couldn't make up for it anyway. Rejoice one who has been brought near to God and has no need to live as a functional legalist this way, making up for last week. Rejoice because God's grace has covered over your sin and given you the freedom to approach the God of grace in every moment where he is near. Take it as a personal command. Rejoice. Blessed is the one whose sin is forgiven, whose iniquity is covered. Blessed is the man, woman, child, teen, youth, elderly saint, empty nester, recent sinner, impatient one, one who has struggled with the same sin repeatedly, materialist, idolater, addicted one. Blessed is that one. How is that possible? Because all of those sins are forgiven and you can now draw near to the Lord by faith because he will not turn you away because of Jesus. And not only can you draw near in some sort of obligatory, humbled, broken, worthless kind of approaching this judge who for some reason is allowing you to creep into heaven, you can now Stand and rejoice before him in his mercy and his grace. There is a difference between sort of half-hearted acceptance, well, I, I guess God's gracious, and the rejoicing in the grace of God that God intends for his people. There's a difference between knowing water is good and drinking it. Grace is meant to be a daily overflow of the heart. Repentance is not a burden for the Christian life. It's the turning on of the fountain of grace. I would encourage you to think of repentance and humble submission to God that way. It's not adding a burden to you. It's like turning on the faucet of grace, experiential grace, the reminder of grace. When we delay, we're not doing anything but missing out on the joy of seeing the grace of God. Rejoice. Rejoice, you forgiven sinner. Rejoice, you Christian who is genuinely and imperfectly following God. Rejoice. Seek the grace of God and seek the God of grace. Let's pray. Father, I want to particularly pray for those that are prone to low-grade 
guilt and fear of you. Lord, I pray that anyone who lives with a subtle sense of your anger or, or perhaps a sense that you regret saving them, that they haven't lived up to the investment. Lord, I pray that you would right now flood their hearts with the assurance of your grace. Lord, we live in your grace, we live under your grace, but Lord, we, we need the, the joy of it to flood our hearts. But we need to functionally drink it deeply. I pray you would pour that sense of the assurance of your grace over those, especially those who live with an ongoing uncertainty about your favor. Lord, I also want to pray, Lord, for any of us who have been, been clinging to some, some area of sin, we, we've been just resisting and ignoring your hand of conviction. Lord, we viewed our Christian life as good enough already. And Lord, maybe it's something we just don't want to give up. some perspective, some bitterness, some idol, some substitute for you, some habit. Lord, I pray that your hand would remain heavy until that son or daughter turns to you. And the moment they do, Lord, give them a flood of the assurance of your forgiveness and your grace. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.